In terms of education, what are some of the things we can do to make the youth capable of taking up uh, the roles they have to play, assuming that Ghana is on the path to having several airlines, several maintenance facilities, um, uh, several maybe smaller level manufacturing activities. If these were to materialize, what are some of the things we can do to unleash the potential for the youth to join in? This is a strategic question. Basically what I'm saying is, looking forward, assuming that things are going to improve with airlines, maintenance facilities, and the manufacturing, what should we be doing now to be able to take advantage when that happens? The reason why airlines are going to back is because they are usually employing expatriates. And for you to employ an expatriate, you know that you are paying for him and his family. The expat comes to Ghana, works two weeks, go out two weeks and come back and comes back. And all is on the airline. So we need to train. We need to we need to remove our minds from the basic jobs. For instance, go and take a reservation, customer service. Because if you're looking for that, then we have a lot of people in Ghana who have done that. When will they start thinking about doing aircraft, mashallah, learning engineering? So we have to encourage them to go to those parts. Because when they do that, then it means we don't have to employ any experts. When you go to our maintenance, for instance, it's all about one white guy or the other. But what um, one airline has started doing is that they are training Ghanaians in the engineering and maintenance world, which is good. But when you look at it, you even see more men than women. Why? Because the women are just ready to just come and sit on the front desk and then, hello, hi, why are you going to grab or something? But they don't want to think bad. They don't want to think for the important jobs. Doing a crack master is okay, but how do you update yourself? I was a secretary, just a normal secretary. And then, you know, that's the woman's job. So when I went into um, the round session, a secretary was not needed because it's purely technical. And you know, when they are doing their, their reports, cut and paste, they take their reports and go out. So I was real, I realized that I was under each other. So I went to the big man and I said, look, they should either change me or you know get me somewhere better. Because I was thinking about the PR session because I did photography and all of that. And I did PR, so I think I should move there. They said no. So I decided to anytime I come to work, I take my camera and then go out and take pictures of FODs, the foreign object debris. Okay, and I send the report. So it was like, it was quite interesting. And then, on and on and on, I decided, look, let me also go and mash up. I can do it. We went to the school, I failed three times. The fourth time I was told that, look, <laughs> if you fail, you know, you are not coming back. I mean, you go back to the office. And I had to try. After that, you have to mash up the aircraft. It's not easy. You need to do your physics, your maths, and all that. No the way, no geography. And I was just a secretary, short-term typing. But I found myself in that place, and I realized in the next 10 years, if I don't move on in the aviation industry, then, because now, bosses don't need secretaries anymore. The, the clouds and everything, filing is becoming something else. So I needed to do it, and I did it. And now we have 15 women in Marshall. And it's a job that is really demanding. And I can tell you, we are even lacking right now in our, in our section. If one person, I'm, I'm supposed to be on duty, and I'm out here, everything is good. And apart from Marshall, we do a lot. Bed, bed strike, bed management. So if you're assigned to a new about beds, I'm not going, they have actually people who learn about beds, because the wings, you know, and then the aircraft is more like a bed. We didn't do that life where we have to go and chase beds on the runway, 
Your teeth are bent, the pilot can't manage. He told the controller that look, your master needs to go on the floor and go and start the beds. We have animals around, dogs in those areas crossing the wrong and the line. And we have to take them and we're looking for them. Because if there's best strike, she's in trouble, I'm in trouble, he's in trouble. So this is an area I believe that we also have to look at. So when we are going to our training schools, we need to look at those things. It's, it's, a, it's a place that people don't really have, don't want to go and don't know. So please, aircraft marshalling, when you're doing your process, put it there. And it's a very, very interesting thing. Apart from marshalling, we do the hot seat, where we, we communicate with control tower, control tower, and then we communicate with the men on the ground, and then control tower, you know, we do a lot of communication. Apart from that, we do um, we make sure that Securities are held to at the air side. People driving on the air side, make sure you're wearing your reflector and your PPEs. We are always on point. So it's a it's a job that I trust that a lot of especially women will have to go through. NTC, are you guys how are you doing on the youth front? First of all, can you tell us what ATC does in brief? Because I know it's a lot. They guide our planes in the air and terminal. And then how do you do with engaging the youth of Ghana in what you do? In brief, when you talk of air traffic control, and let me simplify it by giving you something on ground. Look at a, a policeman at a multiple intersection where you have cars conflicting at a point and the policeman be directing the traffic in such a way that they do not collide. Let the policeman be there for 30 seconds and you see a lot of crash. In the air, we have air routes. They are not just flying by flying safety. The pilot is in control of manipulation and command of the aircraft is the sole jurisdiction of the pilot. But they are flying on routes, whether they are descending, climbing, crossing one's path. If you have the flight radar here, you see the multiples of aircraft in this space. The one behind the scene, you do not see who is controlling all this traffic to make sure the outcome of conflict is the air traffic controller. So separation of aircraft from one another and from obstacles like you talk of mast mountains and any other obstacles from coming against the responsibility of the air traffic controller. Now, back to your question. How are we engaging the youth? We are behind the scenes professionals. You go to the airport, you can hardly see an air traffic controller. You see all the other professionals, but you can't see them. Because where we are is a restricted place. You need extra permission to come there because of the high security around it. Let the control center or control tower be bombed and the airport is gone. Nobody is coming to the airport again. So it's a high security area. That is why you don't see them. However, we do, um, we organize forum and Apart from that, every year, 20th October is Air Traffic Controller Day, the day of the International Day of the Air Traffic Controller. Globally, 20th October every year, we celebrate that day. And when we do that, we send letters to institutions, and then we send notice on FM stations, TV networks, to the public. We do an open day, that day, the control center, the all the ATC facilities, are no more the secured one. So we have our security on guard that allow people to come in for lectures, for sightseeing, to see actually what is going on. And then we also go on radio and TV to also give stations uh, like what we are doing. So we do that annually. Beyond that, um, Unless we are doing other forum, 
educational forum, like some seminars that we do, which we advertise for people to come. So it's left to the public, just as we are doing now. As I said earlier in the previous panel discussion, that when you hear anything about aviation, any celebration or whatever it is, just go there. Once it is an, an open forum, take advantage, you're not paying anything. Just go there and listen. Maybe that may be the day you are going to be employed. <laughs> yes, my interest in aviation was, I was somebody who usually visited the airport a lot. Whether somebody is traveling, my family or not, I guess once in a while I go to the airport. And I was always asking that glass office, who are the people working there? You know, the control tower is always the eye everywhere. And I kept on asking and asking and asking. Nobody was giving me any help. Until I saw an advert and an apply. And got to realize what I was looking for is what I applied for. So motivate yourself. And then passion is very necessary. Thank you. So guys, make a move October 20th every year. And go see what they do. I've been there many times. Go see what they do if you have the time. I believe they control traffic for all of West Africa, right? As a region. Or is it most of West Africa? Not West Africa. IQ has uh, regionalized the control areas. So the Accra Pride Information Region is the land space of Accra, including a large portion of the ocean up to latitude 9 degrees south of the ocean. So the ocean size is about four times the size of land area of Ghana. And traffic within this area are all controlled by Accra. Yeah. So essentially, somebody somewhere, maybe not Africa will hand over control to you as the aircraft is traveling. Yeah, that so is. you will take it and track it. That there. is it. So if one aircraft departs from Accra, it moves from one flight information region to the other. So before it gets to the next flight information region, we have already transmitted every information about the aircraft to the next flight information region. And we are in communication with that region. So by the time we say contact this control center on this frequency, they know about that traffic. They know about that traffic. So we are mutually working together as one community. When you talk about the air traffic control system globally, we are working together as one community. What is happening at Hitro is what is happening here. You don't need any different training Hitro than to work in Accra. Standardized form of training by International Civil Aviation Organization. So it's uniform. That is why you can have aircraft flying across with the same standards. There's no mediocrity anywhere. Safety is of priority. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Cecilia, as you know, most people here, we think anyway, I think of becoming pilots or flight attendants or whatever. As a young person, you are sort of an example to them. Can you tell us what your typical day is like? So you get up in the morning, uh, you have your, whatever you have for breakfast, and then what? So your typical day. Um, well, the days vary very much. Um, we have, we can start as early as 5 a.m. We can start as late as 3 p.m. So the day is very, very much. If I start at 5 a.m., I typically don't have breakfast. Oh. <laughs> it's a little too early for that. So you have a hungry parent. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> no, then I, I typically have something on board the aircraft uh, around 8 a.m. or something when, you know, it's a usual breakfast time. Um, so if I start at 5 a.m., usually we come, we meet at the office. We start with a briefing, we go through paperwork, go through weather, 
go through everything for our flights, our routes that day. And then we brief, we brief together the pilot, the pilot, the captain and the first officer brief together, and then we go, we brief the cabin crew, and we all brief on our flights that day what we are to expect with the weather, what we are to expect with the aircraft, our number of passengers, or you know, everything that could affect our flight that day. And after that, we typically leave from the office to the airport. Go through departure formalities, same as the passengers. We have to go through security. Um, on the domestic flights, we don't check our identification, but on International flights, we do. We have to go through immigration, same as the passengers do. Then we get to the aircraft. Typically, the engineers have to start the aircraft. So the aircraft is running on what's called the APU, the auxiliary power. So it's not running on engine power, but a smaller engine is powering the electronics of the aircraft. Then we go through the checks. We have to check that the aircraft is fully serviceable, check that everything is in its right order. And then uh, once that's done, once we have fuel, we have catering, we, the aircraft is clean, then we typically call for boarding, as we call it, and call the passengers to the aircraft. And then uh, the passengers take their time getting there, you know. Typically we have to call one or two late passengers and have to wait for them, then they show up at the aircraft late, and, you know. But then um, once all of that is done, um, then we are ready to go, we've gone through our checklist, everyone is seated, they have their, fast, their seatbelts fastened, they've seen the, the, well the cabin crew give them uh, the in-flight demonstration, so you know what to do in case of an emergency or that. Then we call the tower, we call uh, air traffic control because they have to give us a clearance to start our engines. So that's the first call we make after we start our engines and we have to call for taxi because we can't start moving without ATC's instruction. When we start the engines, the marshalers marshal us for our engines. So we, when we are sitting in the aircraft, we can't see that the, the area around the aircraft is clear. And uh, it has to be clear for us to start the engines. We can't, um, once we start the engines, there's a lot of, um, it draws a lot of power, it, starts, it has a lot of suction. So we have to make sure that all around the engines, all around the aircraft, it's all clear. The marshalers are there when we start the engines, and then after we request a taxi from ATC, and they also marshal us out to make sure that we don't hit any other aircraft around us, any other vehicle moving around the aircraft. And then uh, we go on our way. Typically, with Africa World, we do two or three destinations a day. So we'll go, come back. Uh, for example, we'll go to Kumasi first thing in the morning, come back to Accra. That would typically take about an hour and 30 minutes going and coming. Then we do it all again, we turn around the aircraft, clean, refuel, catering, do everything again, go and come again, do it all again, and then for the last time. And then we are done for the day around 1 or 2 p.m. Um, that's a typical day starting early in the morning. Wow, sounds exciting, doesn't it? But what I notice here is all the connections with the other functions. Marshalling, ATC, uh, ground, uh, personnel. Do you, you get pushed back or you do it under the engine power? No, we, we park in such a way that we don't do push back. Wow, they're trying to save money. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Okay, so yeah, so all of that, so you need to recognize the need and somebody asked me about communication there's a lot of that going on between uh, uh, these two so great and right, so for the youth if you want to follow in their footsteps that's the kind of thing that awaits you and it's not impossible not at all i mean the only problem we have in ghana is that um, uh, the opportunities are not widely available but if you're determined you can search for Right now, I think they train in Morocco, they train in South Africa, uh, and the airlines are hungry to get people. Um, the airplane will fly about how many hours a day? Oh, not the aircraft, not you. So after you quit at two, somebody else takes over the aircraft. Yes, the aircraft goes right back into there within 30, 45 minutes. Okay. So, so in the day, the aircraft is using four people. 
for pilots. So as the aviation activity picks up in Ghana, you can see how the need for pilots is really going to pick up. Because pilots are restricted on how many hours they can fly in a day. So even if she says, I'm not tired, I'm not tired, leave me alone, you have to go home. Because you can see that you're living. That's the nature of aviation. Right? Yes, that's right. Very good. How about training? We've had quite a few issues about training here. Uh, I, for my own education, what types of jobs do we train for in Ghana? Where the training is readily available, accepted, and recognized. What type of training yes. in Ghana now? So like flight attendants, we train those here. Marshallists, we train those here. Okay, flight attendant, marshal, and is limited. All the aviation schools, what they have in common is ticketing and reservation, travel and tourism, customer service, and all. But the technical trainings are lacking. The technical trainings are lacking. But I believe that the reason why they are lacking is that it, is, it demands a lot of money. For instance, for a flight attendant training, if you're at school and you want to pursue that dream, you need mock-ups. Yes. And to even build that mock-up is a lot of money. So the money is not there. But for you to do a ticket and reservation training, you don't need that much. You need your IATA books. You pay your lecturers, you pay your students. So it doesn't involve that much. So what 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 we we have to encourage all the schools is that it would be best if the schools come together, put their resources together, and then try to get these technical trainings. So for instance, we have Gata. Gata is big all over West Africa. Gata gets all the schools under one roof and tell them that this week we want to do a technical training that all schools sh should advertise in their names that this course is available whoever wants to train now when we get the students we bring them together Gather tries to get the resource people to train them and then at the end of the day they are certified because these schools have a higher exposure outside than Qatar. One reason being that most of the schools advertise a lot. So if you want the students to come, you can't say it is Qatar, but you're putting together all the schools, and then you bring everyone under one roof. Also, Qatar is like our mother body. So I'm thinking that if Ghana has to certify a school to be an ATO, Ghana can do this course called the Train the Trainer. Put all the schools together, the lecturers, and train them. We are hoping to get a national career in two months' time or whatever. When we get this national career, what I, the question I keep asking is that how are we going to get our pilots? For flight attendants, yes, we have a lot. We can get them. How are we going to get our engineers? The people to sit behind the networking and planning people, commercial. You are looking at head of commercial. And you can count the number of people in Ghana who have that extensive training that you would want to employ as head of commercial. Let me take Africa World, for instance. Africa World head of commercial is a good Yes, he's good in the aviation industry. When the national career comes, I know they'll push him. So now, if they push him and he goes to the national career, what happens to that sport? Do we have the people to handle that? We have to start looking at it. Fine, we don't want to depend on the government. But sometimes, if the government steps in, it will help. It will help save Ghana's office. Uh, we are going into this deal with Ethiopian Airlines. Ethiopian Airlines has a school, Ethiopian Academy, and they have trained Ethiopians. Are they going to 
to bring Ethiopians to work in Ghana? Do we have something in the clause stating that if that business comes to pass, they will pay Ghanaians to Ethiopia since Ethiopia is very big and train them in this technical courses? We need to start asking those questions. We can't do it alone. So we need to start asking those questions. Thank you. Very, very good point you made. But you know, it comes down to uh, the same question I was asked earlier about strategy. When you actually have a strategy for sort of developing the aviation industry, all of these things will be considered in the strategy because they will be sub objectives. And I hope they exist. I don't know. I haven't seen them. But we'll wait to see. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so. We are hoping to get the airline in two months' time. Right. Have trainings been done? It takes six months. Yeah. We need to train. Yeah. Who in Ghana can tell me boldly that they have been sent out to train for those positions I'm talking about? So. Yeah, good point. Okay, now let's talk a bit about mentorships. Um, I think all of us at this table are capable and qualified to mentor others, especially the youth. Um, as far as the mentoring goes, do you have any opinions on how it could be organized to uh, benefit the nation? I'll start from the end and come this way. How mentorship could be? could be organized to benefit the nation's aviation industry. Because so all of these young people we see before us, some of them may have questions or issues they would like to discuss with somebody. Maybe they like what you do, they want to learn more about it. But as far as mentoring goes, how could it be organized in order to realize this potential that they have? I believe that forums like this needs to be regular. I am a social scientist. I have to you, the group today, have a lot of work to do. So when you come to these forums, and you meet speakers like this, telling you about the experience in the industry and all that, I believe that you should not come with a mindset that, okay, I'm coming to this forum, I'll have my breakfast, my lunch, and then go away. No. But I need to make the connections. I need to ask questions. I need to take numbers. Now, what I've realized in Ghana is that you give your number to someone and the next time the person keeps asking it, can you get me a job? But mentorship is not one person giving you a job. It's you listening to the person, letting the person help you to chart your course. Because when you start asking me for a job, I don't have a job. So I would think that you want to be a nuisance to me. You don't want me to be your mentor. You need me to provide you a job for you to get your salary. Why don't you ask the salient questions? So for everyone here, let's remove it from our minds that when we leave here, we start networking. And we take the numbers. We are going to start typing, I need a job. No. You need to tap into the experience all the speakers here how it is the experience you need what they have been through in the industry how they pick themselves up from one point to the other i have been in the aviation industry for close to 13 years now i started as a ticketing and in Antrac Air. i rose out to be a systems administrator why systems administration it's, it's like a different reservation, but the highest level. I got that position because I did IT. And I added my IT knowledge to the ticketing and reservation, and I got up there. So you don't stop at one place. You don't stop at one place. Come to us, ask us our experience. We'll tell you, we'll share it with you. We will help you. So when you are coming, you need to have your strategic plan, your short, your medium term, and then your long term. Tell your mentor, this is what this is what I want to achieve in the long term. 
in the short term, this is what I want to achieve. And then that person will help you to achieve it. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I can agree with the amazing Paul. I think she said a lot. And now, uh, what I will ask you who are trying to be in the industry, I'm talking about aviation, whether you have the patience and whether you are going to be very serious enough. Because this is an industry that we don't joke with safety. Nothing is left to chance. So if you are not serious about whatever you are doing or whatever you want to do, don't enter that field. If you approach me, I will tell you everything about aviation, the negatives and the positives. And I will highlight the negatives the more for you to know what actually you are going into. But just like he said, you must have a plan. You must know what you are going, you are looking for before we can also lead you as to how to chart your path and what to expect on the way. Because we did not get to where we are so easily. It takes a lot to make yourself who you want to be in aviation. You need to learn a lot. You should be ready to face all the challenges. Patience is one. Paying attention to details is another thing. Safety consciousness is very, very essential. If you are someone that does anything just haphazardly, you are not an aviation material. You have to throw all those things away. Because when we are talking about that, that industry, nothing is left to chance. That is why you have very in high safety in terms of transportation, aviation is the best. The number of road accidents you have, if it were to happen in air transportation, nobody will fly. <laughs> one airplane crashes and the whole world is. But it's just once. Why? Because of the high safety standards. So back to it, yes, mentorship. The leadership of this forum should do well to continue these deliberations regularly, just like she said. Get our contacts and then look for beyond us. We have a lot of professionals in aviation. Look for such people. Get closer to them. We are prepared to lead you and guide you. But, like she said, we don't have the jobs. We are ready to help you, but we don't have the jobs. On the topic of mentorship, I think it's only possible to help somebody that is willing to help themselves. There is only so much you can do as a mentor. But if the person you are mentoring isn't willing to help themselves, there is not much you can do. Um, the aviation industry is a lot about connection. It's a lot about who you know. It's a lot about making those connections. Not that you know somebody that knows somebody, but you have to personally strive to make those connections because that opens doors. It opens a lot of doors. So mentoring is always good. And uh, mentoring should always be, be part of of it all, but you have to be willing to help yourself. And you have to be willing to maybe sometimes go out of your comfort zone a little bit and and seek to make those connections for yourself. Okay, I think I have a few people here, this year that I had met on. We have women in aviation, Ghana chapter, where we the ladies, if you are not part, I think you should be part of it to go to the schools. And then the individuals to kind of you know, mentor them and tell them what it is that they want to do. But now what is actually happening is that you get somebody and he says, Oh, I've gone to the aviation school. What is your basic? I did essence. 
now you cannot enter the aviation school. Aviation, you can't ever come here. That's why I went with essence. You start from degree So I always tell them, get to your degree. And then also try and do attachment. You say, I want to do attachment. I don't want to pay as a ten million now. <laughs> and the aviation industry is not where somebody would like to, you know, you just bring somebody, somebody then you are, you are going to start on the job. No, they won't take you. You need the experience. So when you come and do your attachment, you are with them, and then they realize that you are doing very well. The next time they are taking. Okay, let us do better for them once again. Experience. My name is Charles Chum. I am the director of Ghana Civil Aviation Training Academy. Hello, Ghana. My name is Audrey A.C. Swatson, and I'm Ghana's youngest female pilot, CEO of Excel Aviation Limited. I duly endorse GH Aviation. I endorse GH Aviation as the authentic mouthpiece and everything about aviation and more.